Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back uh, to those here in the Malonglo Theatre at the ANU and to everyone online. Uh, my name is Stephen Howes, and I'm the director of the Development Policy Centre, and I'll be chairing uh, this, uh, this second half of our half-day workshop. Uh, I think we can all agree, you know, the first uh, session was, uh, was really fascinating. Um, you know, for, for many of us, quite familiar with the Australian scheme and... Uh, and somewhat with the New Zealand scheme, but uh, I think a lot of what we heard this morning about the US and the Canadian scheme was uh, really new and, uh, and very thought-provoking. So I just want to um, thank Philip. He gave those great presentations. Uh, so now we're gonna go to those um, areas we're perhaps more familiar with, but um, you know, we hope to uh, look at them in a new and sort of comparative light. And uh, we've got the two speakers uh, this morning, uh, both part of our team at the Development Policy Centre. Uh, Charlotte Bedford, who's um, done a lot of work both on the Australian Seasonal Worker Program and uh, on the New Zealand RSC, and who's actually uh, joining us from New Zealand where she, where she lives. And then uh, after Charlotte, we've got Richard Curtin. Uh, Richard's also part of our team at the Devel Development Policy Centre, has been working um, on the seasonal worker program uh, for a long time. And uh, it'll be great to hear your reflections, uh, Richard. And of course, Richard's the person who put this whole workshop uh, together. So I wanna thank him for that. And then uh, we do have three respondents. So I'll, I'll introduce them sort of when we come to that part of the uh, session. I'm sorry we don't have more time for Q&A. Uh, I guess we were just trying to pack in as much information uh, as we could. And I know a number of you, there will be further opportunities for interaction um, over lunch and then in the afternoon uh, for a number of you. And I'll, I'll make a few closing remarks at the end about how you know, I do see this as a start of an interaction, you know, the first word, not the last word. So please take it in that spirit. But yeah, if you do have questions, if you're online, please put them in the chat function. And if you're here uh, in the room, uh, please uh, you know, stay for lunch and there'll be lots of time there for, uh, for exchange. Okay, well, that's enough for me. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Charlotte and I hope you're online, Charlotte. And um, you have uh, 25 minutes uh, for your talk. And Charlotte will be talking to us on New Zealand's recognised seasonal employer scheme, an industry-led initiative. So please welcome Thanks Charlotte. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm just um, sharing my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. And yes, I am. Uh, I'm in New Zealand. Uh, I'm based in the South Island down in the Otago region where we um, grow a lot of cherries and also wine. Uh, and I have been involved in the RSE, um, research on the RSE since the scheme uh, was introduced in 2007. So just um, a little bit on background. Uh, as I say, the scheme was implemented 2007. And it originated from a lot of co-design work that was done by industry and government in the mid-2000s to address um, some quite significant seasonal labour shortages that were leading to a crisis in the profitability of our horticulture industry. For us, it is fruit, vegetables and wine because of an inability to get high quality fruit and veggies picked, packed and to market in time. And while this work was going on um, by industry and government, at the same time, we had repeated requests from uh, Pacific countries for uh, greater access to the New Zealand and to the Australian uh, labour markets. So these two sort of factors coincided uh, and the RSE scheme was born. And our focus on the Pacific um, made sense given New Zealand already has very extensive uh, relationships and uh, shared knowledge with Pacific uh, states. So the scheme involves uh, nine Pacific countries, uh, the same uh, as that are involved in the uh, Australian program. And about 90% of our um, RSE arrivals are from Pacific countries. Um, we also have a small number um, who come from Southeast Asia, around about 1,500 uh, workers a year. And those are under pre-existing uh, employment uh, arrangements. 
Uh, the RSU visa is employer specific. Uh, it's for a maximum of seven months. Um, and we do give uh, Kiribati and Tuvalu up to nine months uh, in recognition of the um, greater distance and uh, associated travel costs for workers from those two countries. And the work is strictly seasonal and there is no ability to transition onshore to another visa or for workers to find alternative employment. And they're not able to bring uh, family members or uh, dependents. And we mainly recruit men. Um, prior to COVID, the uh, female participation rate was somewhere around 12%. Uh, percent. And the scheme is governed by an annual cap uh, that is set at 16,000 uh, for the current year. Uh, and the cap is in place to avoid uh, displacement of New Zealand workers. So this slide here uh, shows a diagrammatic representation of the RSE. Uh, and this was actually developed uh, for the very first evaluation that was done uh, back in 2009. Uh, and it was designed to just highlight some of the key stakeholders uh, and relationships uh, between them um, in the scheme's operation. And I'm sorry, I know the text uh, is not particularly clear, um, but unfortunately I'm not able to change the font. So this is what we've got. Um, but I've included it because um, it provides this sort of conceptualization of RSE as a system um, with the employer and the worker relationship at the heart of the scheme is um, now quite common in the thinking of policy makers and um, industry leaders um, work, working on aspects of RSE. And by seeing the scheme as a system, it emphasizes the interdependence and interconnectedness of different RSE stakeholders who work collectively for the success of the program. And it reinforces that the scheme is susceptible to change uh, and it does evolve over time. I'm not really gonna spend time on implementation arrangements. Um, our uh, RSE was, uh, the design of the scheme was uh, informed by the Canadian SORP and also um, is very similar to the Australian program. Um, I will just note that for employers, they do have to, once they have RSE accreditation, uh, they do have to apply uh, every year for their RSE workers, uh, and they must um, obviously go through labour market testing and um, prove that there are no New Zealanders available to do the required jobs. And similar to other schemes, uh, employers are, have primary responsibility for worker welfare, and they have to meet a range of uh, welfare requirements, and this includes the provision of worker accommodation. And in recent years, we've actually had um, a significant increase in purpose-built uh, RSE worker accommodation. And this is linked to a government policy that was introduced in uh, 2019 to reduce reliance on our um, low-cost residential housing market in certain regions. So between 2018 and 2020, we've had a 67% increase in purpose-built uh, beds for RSE, which is helping to mitigate some of those pressures on the um, domestic housing market. The scheme is heavily uh, regulated and very closely monitored. We have a range of stakeholders uh, that support employers and workers in New Zealand and monitor compliance. And we've had some recent policy changes. Um, now, uh, workers must be paid the living wage, which is higher than uh, the our national minimum wage. And employers must now guarantee 30 hours of work a week, every week. Um, we used to allow an averaging of 30 hours over the duration of the contract, but that has um, been removed. And while workers can't switch employers, uh, the scheme has always allowed employers to uh, share workers with others through formal sharing arrangements. And these, uh, there's widespread use of um, joint ATRs uh, within the program. And finally, I just note, obviously, RSE is only one component of our total seasonal workforce. Uh, New Zealanders are a key part and um, as well as other overseas labour, such as backpackers and international students. And in some regions, um, backpackers actually make up a more important, um, the larger share of the seasonal workforce than RSE. Um, but RSE has become the core seasonal workforce because of the guaranteed and reliable supply of RSE labour. So this slide here um, shows the annual cap and um, RSE arrivals from 2007 up to 2022. And it's really just here to show you that the scheme is very small. Um, when the program was introduced, we had a cap of 5,000 uh, and we started with uh, 68 RSE employers. 
uh, end up by 2018-19. Um, that was the last full year of recruitment before COVID. We had 147 employers and we had around 12 and a half thousand arrivals. So the cap, as you can see, that's the green line, um, has gone up. It's sort of plateaued at 8,000 for a few years and then started to increase again. And our RSE arrivals have um, really just gone up in line with the cap. Uh, we had the border closed in March 2020, and so we've had um, a real drop in numbers uh, with COVID. And they're starting, slowly starting to come up again now. And this slide shows our Pacific RSE uh, arrivals over the last 15 years, and um, it's here just to really show the dominance of three countries, uh, Vanuatu in the purple, Tonga in the bright blue, and Samoa in the red. Uh, and Samoa has actually um, taken over from Tonga and is now our second uh, largest provider. And during COVID, uh, our RSC recruitment has been restricted to certain countries. Uh, and Tonga, uh, sorry, Vanuatu, uh, Samoa and Tonga have been the main ones. So it has really um, sort of reinforced the dominance of those countries as our primary uh, providers of labour. And just a little bit about our employers. Um, we have a mix of directors, uh, labour contractors and grower cooperatives, but the majority uh, of employers employ their workers directly, and this includes travel to the Pacific states to do uh, their own recruitment. And our DRC, who has uh, over 100 workers, actually has a permanent presence in Vanuatu to handle their um, RSE recruitment. So we don't have um, a large number of labour hire companies and direct employers are the most uh, common in RSE. And the distribution of workers across employers is highly uneven. As Professor Martin said earlier, workers are concentrated with the largest employers. Uh, so in 2018-19, which was our last full year of recruitment, um, we had about 12,500 arrivals and 45% of those workers went to the 10 largest employers. Um, but we actually have a lot of very small um, employers in the scheme as well, who um, each recruit fewer than 20 workers um, a year. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, sharing of workers between employers under formal sharing arrangements. Uh, and one of the, possibly one of the distinctive features of REC is our annual REC survey, which is designed to uh, find out how the scheme is uh, meeting growers' needs. And that survey started in 2008, and it covers a range of topics, um, including recruitment, um, perceptions of workers' behaviour um, and of their performance, and changes in business practices and impacts of the scheme on uh, business investment strategies. And that's become a key part of monitoring uh, how the RSC is operating over time. And some of the other distinctive features, I think, of RSC probably linked to the structure of our uh, horticulture industry. And the horde industry here is um, largely export driven and it is dominated by three crops, uh, kiwi fruit, wine and apples. Uh, and um, our employment of RSC workers is heavily concentrated in the regions where those um, um, products are grown. And we have had rapid expansion of our horticulture industry since the mid 2000s with increasing demand for New Zealand's products overseas and very strong growth in export markets. We're now up to 6.6 billion, up from 2.7 billion um, back in 2007. And while RSE is only one component of our total seasonal workforce, the scheme has played a critical and enabling role in the expansion of our horticulture industry due to the certainty of the labour that the scheme provides. Finals from our annual RSE survey show that the key benefits for employers are a more stable seasonal workforce, a higher quality and more productive workforce, and the flow on effect of being able to employ more New Zealanders in permanent roles. And access to RSE workers is now considered an essential part of the business model for large producers who have focused on premium export markets. And the reliability of the labour through RSE is facilitating a shift to new high yield varieties and planting systems and year round production activity that stimulates demand for seasonal and permanent staff. So industry has always had a very strong voice in REC. Um, as I mentioned, the scheme was co-designed by industry and government, and that was really to address some uh, structural problems in the horticulture industry that were linked to a low wage, low productivity and low investment cycle and associated shortages of reliable seasonal labour. 
So prior to the scheme's introduction, we had about 17,000 um, people working illegally in horticulture. But as part of the background to the scheme, um, major efforts were made by industry to sort of clean up grower practices and reduce this reliance on uh, casual labour under illegal conditions. And over the past 10 to 15 years, as our horticulture industry has become increasingly export focused, growers have had to pay more attention to requirements for socially sustainable production to meet international consumer demands. So as part of that, for New Zealand producers, third party certification, mainly via Global Gap, is now a key part of access to our export markets. And Global Gap comes with regular auditing requirements, and if any evidence is found of poor employment practices or any form of worker exploitation, either in the growers' enterprise or anywhere in the supply chain, then they risk losing access to lucrative export markets. So this third-party certification has played a very significant role in raising industry-wide standards um, for employment standards, conditions, and for compliance, not just for RSE, but for non-RSE farms as well. And in particular, I think it helps mitigate the use of illegal labour because for growers, the risks to accreditation are simply too great. And while Australia, I think, is tackling some issues at the moment um, with worker absconding or what I think is now termed disengagement from the scheme, it isn't something that's really been uh, an issue for RSE. And I think that is partly due to the fact there's no incentive for workers to abscond because they won't find work elsewhere on farms outside of RSE. In our annual RSE conference uh, is another important feature of the scheme. This is organised by industry uh, and is always very well attended by RSE employers, as well as New Zealand and Pacific government officials and a wide range of RSE stakeholders. And the conference is a very important vehicle for building coherence and consistency in interaction between growers, policymakers, and other uh, stakeholders in the RSE system. And it plays a major role in building what I think is uh, has become a rather distinctive RSE. Interact the relationships they form and how their interactions are organised to ensure that the policies objectives are kept in balance. So for workers, um, obviously key uh, benefits of participation relate to the regular source of income and also opportunities for skills development. And I'll just quickly note Buccaneer Sina is our RSE Workers Skills Training Programme. Uh, that offers a range of foundation courses, but also a lot of uh, more now more advanced practical courses uh, in things like um, building, plumbing, small engine maintenance. Um, and these are courses are designed to um, provide workers with skills that will be transferable to their home environments. So there are the same uh, weaknesses in RSE that are inherent in other schemes, linked to the restrict restrictive visa and uh, employment conditions, um, as well as lack of worker voice and workers not wanting to speak up um, and complain, and also some of the negative uh, social impacts that are associated with uh, regular and repeated absences from family. And while we've always had an annual uh, employer survey, uh, we've never surveyed workers on their views on the scheme, um, but that's now changing. Um, with uh, industry have got uh, their own initiative um, for an anonymous online uh, worker survey. And if the survey is run annually alongside the employer survey, then this will help government and industry to gather a more comprehensive picture of what and what isn't working so well with the programme. So the scheme has been uh, impacted quite significantly during uh, COVID. Um, as I mentioned earlier, RSE recruitment has now been restricted to uh, certain Pacific countries, mainly uh, Vanuatu, Samoa and Tonga. And this is changing employers' recruitment patterns, and I think it may limit the engagement of some uh, Pacific countries in RSE in the uh, future. When our border closed in March 2020, we had around about 11,000 um, RSE workers on shore. And two years later, about 25%, over 2,800 um, are still here. Um, and those are now effectively um, long-term workers. And so they have had to have their visas repeatedly extended, uh, and they're now employed in uh, full-time year-round work. And for those workers and their families, they're coping with much longer absences uh, than the usual five to seven months, 
and there have been a range of worker welfare um, issues that have arisen linked to these longer absences. And we've had um, a heightened focus actually on worker welfare um, during COVID and now have a more collaborative approach um, taken to the management of welfare issues, um, which involves a, a wide range of community stakeholders. And industry and government uh, collaboration has further strengthened uh, during COVID as well. Industry has taken the lead on the allocation of our uh, annual cap and worked very closely with government to facilitate the entry of RSC workers um, through very restrictive um, border settings. And industry has also taken a lead role in worker repatriations, uh, working alongside the New Zealand and Pacific governments um, to return workers to their home countries. So I would argue that the scheme is now largely industry led with a level of um, government oversight. And there is recognition by government, uh, no matter who is in power, that the scheme uh, plays a critical role in uh, supporting the seasonal labour needs of our horticulture industry. So just quickly on the current season, I just want to note that it is um, proving to be a very challenging one. Um, we've had high production volumes um, across our main crops due to excellent growing conditions. Bike growers face the double whammy of a shortage of labour um, and high costs of trying to get fruit to export markets. So we've got about 10,000 RSC workers here at the moment, so in a, uh, below the cap of 16,000. We're short about 6,500 backpackers. Uh, we've got low unemployment in our um, in the regions, so lack of local staff, uh, and we've been um, had our Omicron um, wave recently. So as a result, um, growers are finding it difficult to find staff and they're paying much higher wage rates uh, at the moment in efforts particularly to get locals into the work um, along with a range of other incentives. And we've got major disruptions to our global supply chains and soaring freight costs. So um, the kiwi fruit industry is chartering vessels to get our fruit to our market. Uh, and for apples, the standard shipping costs are up about 60% on last year, and uh, to get a box of apples to the US is now up 135%. Um, Our energy costs have almost doubled, the minimum wage has gone up, and there are rising on-farm costs linked to Global Gap certification. Um, and these costs just can't be passed on to consumers in, in very competitive markets. So for some growers, the production costs are mean crops are now uneconomic, and they're just uh, simply leaving the industry. So COVID has been, is having an impact not just on how RSE operates, but also on the wider horticulture industry. I think it'll be very interesting to see if there's a more consolidation and rationalization of our horticulture industry that occurs um, post COVID as uh, some of these smaller enterprises exit the industry. And the last slide really is just um, looking ahead. Um, we do have our RSE policy review underway at the moment that has been uh, ongoing for some time, um, but I think uh, progress is being made with it. Um, and they're really looking at streamlining processes uh, for employers and reducing um, some red tape. So this includes looking at areas of the policy where industry can take more of a leadership role, such as the allocation of our uh, annual cap. And there is no move at the stage to uh, remove the annual cap. And there's also some consideration of a multi-year um, RSE visa, similar to uh, what Australia has done. And there is some quiet talk of new Pacific labour mobility schemes. Um, I know that the dairy and forestry uh, sectors have been asking for RSE arrangements for quite some time. So I would anticipate that if um, new schemes were trialled, these they may well be in um, dairy and forestry. And our RSC policy review fits within, sits within a much wider um, review of New Zealand immigration policy that's underway at the moment. And this may well see uh, stricter controls on the use of low skilled and low wage uh, labour. And instead, industries like horticulture are going to face growing pressure to invest in labour saving technologies and continue to do more to uh, upskill New Zealanders. So mechanisation is already very widespread in our wine industry uh, and investment in automated technologies in fruit, uh, such as mobile um, picking platforms and a shift to new planting systems that better suit robotics uh, is also underway. 
Um, but the shift to automation is expensive and it's a long-term goal. And our um, actually our new uh, CEO of Horticulture New Zealand recently said that if technology and automation was more advanced and a genuine solution, growers would be using it without question. So in the meantime, um, as part of the ROC policy review, I would like to think that New Zealand would consider some bolder um, policy changes, similar to Australia's PALM, which now offers a four-year multi-entry visa and the option for short-term uh, seasonal workers to transition into longer-term roles onshore. This makes Australia very, a very attractive prospect uh, for Pacific workers, and I really think uh, New Zealand should consider a similar option for our skilled uh, and experienced ROC workers who return year after year. And given the ongoing sort of impacts of COVID on REC and on the wider um, horticulture industry, the work that's happening with our um, wider immigration review and the very significant changes really that are being implemented in Australia, I also think now would be an ideal time to have a rethink of the REC. Um, it's an excellent opportunity to bring all of the uh, key stakeholders in the REC system back together again. Uh, to collaborate in the co-design of a scheme that would be fit for purpose uh, in the post-COVID future. And that's it from me. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks very much, Charlotte, for bringing us up to date on the ROC. Don't emulate. Issues and challenges. Well, I want to say, uh, have Philip here work with his book. And uh, when I started here, I gave a copy. To so we were get uh, Philip here. Philip sent an email who uh, I'm happy to give a presentation. So thank into your family visit. I'm presenting today, I was thinking that uh, we've put a lot of effort into trying to understand the supply side of the seasonal work program, and that's involved uh, work in, uh, that I've done in Vanuatu, in Tonga, in uh, Papua New Guinea and Samoa, um, and in Timor-Leste in particular, uh, and in Tonga, uh, looking at the arrangements that exist, and they're spelt out in the report that Stephen and I have done on the Seasonal Work uh, uh, Governance Program, which is on the Dev Policy website. Also, that report covered the issues to do with how the scheme is regulated and monitored in Australia, and I'll be talking a bit about that during this uh, presentation. But the demand side is not something that uh, we've looked closely enough at. We wrote a paper, four of us, uh, in 2018, comparing the Australian arrangements and uh, context with the New Zealand scheme, and that, that paper is also available. But what I'm trying uh, to do today is to offer some suggestions about what the factors might be that have a deeper impact on the operation of the seasonal work program in terms of the, the economic and political arrangements that affect how employers make their decision as to what sort of uh, uh, migrant labour that they do employ. The opening question I've got is, why has Australia's seasonal worker program, why isn't it much larger than it is? And 
I came across a, a recent article by um, uh, John Gibson and uh, Rochelle Bailey who have highlighted the problem of the under-representation of seasonal workers in Australia compared to New Zealand when you take into account the ratio to the uh, workforce. Uh, if the New Zealand uh, ratio was applied to the Australian seasonal worker program, there'd be 54,000 workers in Australia. Uh, let me just take it. If um, in the same, uh, if, if we're looking at the more recent figures, and I hear today that um, it's considerably up on the, uh, 20, with 23,000, but the figure that I've seen is that there are 16,000 now in Australia compared to uh, 4,000 from, or associated with what was called the Pacific Labor Scheme. Uh, if even with those ratios, uh, that higher number, we're still getting, uh, t we would have expected twice the number than existed. So the issue is what is, uh, uh, sorry, th there's another uh, detail there, and that's the Canadian scheme. If we're talking about um, an estimated 43,900 for 2017 and applied that same ratio, to Australia, then we would have 28,000 uh, seasonal workers here compared to the 13,500 that existed for calendar year 2019. So what, what are the factors that might explain why there's been a lower take up of the seasonal worker program? Uh, is it to do with uh, grower resistance? Uh, to do with the the resistance to the extra monetary and transaction costs that are involved uh, compared with a cheaper, less demanding labour source in the form of backpackers. Now, to some extent, that is the obvious uh, first answer that you would provide for trying to explain it. Australia has much larger dependent on, dependence on backpackers, as we saw, compared to uh, New Zealand. But the issue is why are they choosing to go with backpackers who are traditionally regarded as much more unreliable because they've got that ability to get up and, and move. Uh, the, also the issue of whether you're able to source them in the first place, particularly if you're in a, a remote location. But there's also the issue of uh, their lacking in productivity simply because uh, they don't have the relevant uh, work experience in the crop that they're being asked to, to work on. And there are other factors here. Uh, to what extent um, are growers, due to their small scale of operations, dependent on labour hire operators who can only charge a certain uh, amount because of the pressure from the growers to keep their costs low? And so that means that they are under-resourced to be able to expand recruitment from SWP sending countries. Or is it to do with the geographical and seasonal spread of horticulture in Australia, which just makes it too difficult to invest, for example, in facilities, accommodation facilities uh, for seasonal workers in any one location? But it, are there a deeper set of pressures that are operating is it to do with the domestic supply chain? We know that uh, vegetable producers only 10% uh, export their crop. In case of uh, fruit and nuts, is 25%. Many producers are locked into uh, contracts or um, supply commitments to the domestic, the four major supermarket chains. Are they operating does that put them into a situation where they're continually operating on limited margins with little prospect of growth that would be provided if they were accessing new markets? So let's um, look at the more general issue of um, the 
pressure that comes from the governance structure that imposes uh, high costs on employers for engaging SWP workers. The highly regulated nature of the scheme is, uh, we've argued in our report, a response to two uh, sets of pressures. One is the fear of a local political backlash from regional communities who are concerned that their local job opportunities are being taken up by um, workers who they fear may be uh, cheaper than uh, local workers. So there's a great emphasis on um, putting extra burden, uh, regulatory monitoring requirements that further uh, act as a, a cost impost on employers that seek to engage um, workers through the SWP from overseas. Also, there's pressure on government from media stories about exploited SWP workers and the emphasis on government to show that they're doing all they can to minimise the risk, but doing it in a way that is centrally administered rather than having mechanisms that enable those uh, problems that are there, that could be emerging, resolved on the ground as close as possible to where they occur. Also, SWP workers and their employers are much easier to monitor for government and non-government organisations, such as uni unions and the diaspora groups. So compared to backpackers, uh, it's very difficult to organise backpackers because they are so mobile. But in the case of seasonal workers, uh, they are in clearly identified uh, locations and they are closely monitored by government. If there's a formal complaint lodged, then uh, government steps in and is able to uh, take uh, steps that affect how the employer operates. Now, the issue of uh, cost is something that's uh, been raised by the industry, and there's an example there of a quote of what's involved from the uh, representative of Ausvig um, Association. Another figure that uh, is presented uh, in, in the employer uh, case about costs is the fact that um, the cost to a grower based on the um, Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Research Economics and Science data is that it costs uh, 1634 compared to $134 for a backpacker or local worker. Now if we look at the actual uh, available data. This is from a ABARES survey. The statistics on the number of seasonal workers is a underestimate and it is a reflection to the fact that the sample that they've uh, been able to draw wasn't uh, large enough to be able to pick up a relatively small group. So the, the statistics for the seasonal Pacific seasonal workers uh, don't reflect the actual number in Australia at that time, but what they do show is the relative importance of the seasonal workers to the other source of migrant farm labour, and that is the working holiday makers. So we can see there that in, in each case, uh, it's, it's uh, three or four times larger reliance on working holiday makers. And the reason why backpackers have maintained their numbers in this analysis that, that Stephen and uh, Eve, Stephen Howes and uh, Evie Sharman have done is showing the importance of the third year visa that only became available in 2018. That that was people, in, backpackers in Australia applying for that third year visa kept the backpacker numbers up. So you can see there in the uh, uh, 
uh, blue is the third year visa and uh, on top of the second year visa in 2021. Another interesting uh, data that's available from ABARES is looking at the division into four quartiles of the average labour on, on the farm on a year-round um, basis. And we can see here the two quartiles even three quartiles have small numbers of uh, workers and the fourth quartile has a much larger number. So basically we're talking about farms that are small, that have relatively few employees. So what I want to do now is to talk about the uh, significance of farm size. And there is uh, a survey that ABARES carried out in 2017 and 18. In fact, these data uh, on vegetable farms refer to over three years, and they're rather limited to a particular region. I think it's the irrigated areas of Sun Asia. And it's part of the difficulty of the ABS data. They, they haven't been able to focus enough on the dynamics or the, the financial performance of key parts of horticulture. So there's no information available on fruit and nuts sector. It's only on, on the vegetable sector. And as I said, this data only relates to one of, of, of the particular regions. But the information shows that uh, the farm size differences were largest for the vegetable industry. And here we see the first uh, diagram is relation to output. And we can see that the, the top <coughs> decile has the, by far the largest output compared to the other nine deciles. Looking at profit, again, we can see that <coughs> profit is in the top decile, 1.8 million based on 17 million capital invested. And a number of um, deciles uh, showing that uh, farms are under experiencing recorded a loss over three years, ranging from 100,000 in the bottom decile to a loss of 67,000, 53,000, respectively, for the two bottom deciles. And had profits of less than 9,000 and 7,500 for the next two deciles. So we see many of the vegetable farms are operating on very, very low margins. Again, the rate of return uh, showed big differences by decile. If we look at the export um, data, the Horticulture excluding wine grapes is 25% of its crop exported in 2019-20. If we include uh, grapes, it rises to 28.9. Uh, nuts, very uh, strong export product. Vegetables, only 11.5%. And I think that whole significance of access to exports, the uh, ability to uh, produce for markets that are expanding is, is a very important part of explaining what the conditions are that a number of growers are facing. What I've presented here is a comparison of the month of uh, visas being granted for seasonal workers comparing Australia with New Zealand and the blue is Australia and the red is New Zealand and we see for New Zealand there's two peaks in October and in February but in Australia the spread is much more over the year uh, and that reflects the much more 
wider range of geographical spread that the industry has. And here is the list of um, the regions that ABES provides. And we see if we look at the proportion of crops produced in particular states, we can see that there's a concentration uh, in particular states. Now there's the profile of uh, where horticulture regions are located. It's the red uh, areas. And we can see they're spread right across from Cairns right down to the south and, and across to Western Australia. And that geographical spread is a, a, an important part of understanding what the uh, constraints are on the way uh, seasonal workers can be deployed and the role of um, labour hire operators. Also within that there are different types of crops with some crops having very short seasons and other crops having much longer seasons, again which affect how seasonal workers can be used. So my final point here is that for further research, I think the, the key question is what type of growers turn to backpackers to meet their labour needs? Are these growers saying that the cost of labour is everything to them, despite the backpackers being unreliable, lack of experience in working productively, and this lack of experience often um, producing bad publicity about under, underpayment particularly in relation to peace rates. Uh, despite those negative aspects, uh, growers do seem to be a certain type of grower does seem to be dependent on that source of labour. So are growers stuck in a low wage, low investment, low productivity cycle that sees backpackers as the answer? My focus is basically on the historical record I'm not talking about uh, the arrangements that it existed uh, under COVID where we're now up to uh, a considerable number have increased because they have been the main source of uh, workers coming in from overseas. The issue would be what happens when uh, backpackers start returning. The comparisons with California, Canada and New Zealand I think offer the potential for real insights into the importance of farm size. In New Zealand, for example, uh, with the large number of the larger employers employing 40% of the RSC workforce, it'd be very I interesting to know are those large employers the, expo the main exporting companies. There's also uh, the importance of accreditation standards. New Zealand has, as Charlotte has mentioned, widespread uh, ad adoption of the global gap. And I think there's also a New Zealand variation of the global gap that uh, exists as well. That doesn't seem to, uh, those industry standards are nowhere near as well established in Australia and they're largely focused on uh, different elements of the agricultural production process, some of which focus on labour, but often um, the other aspects of the agricultural supply chain are not uh, included. So I think what I'm trying to highlight here is that we've got a lot more to do to be able to understand the characteristics of the employers. For example, uh, Charlotte mentioned that survey that is done annually, has been done uh, for the last 10, 11 years of the RSC employers. Well, we uh, do, not, do not have a annual survey like that. There have been some uh, surveys done in the past, but we desperately need good information about what are the characteristics of employers that are engaging 
what type of workers. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. And um, it is a, it's a never-ending process. Uh, three sort of respondents. I'll just um, come up and speak. I think you've got. Uh, so uh, we've got the executive officer for the. It's the uh, employers who are the government to participate in the Pacific Labor Scheme. So Steve will be bringing that uh, perspective, and he's been involved um, with the SWP, you know, right from the start. Uh, and then second, we have uh, Emma Vuetti. Emma is the president of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland. So she's been very involved in, uh, you could say, worker welfare issues. Um, and Emma's also uh, on the advisory council or advisory committee to the government on the uh, Pacific uh, Australia Labor Mobility Scheme. So she'll um, add that uh, invaluable perspective. And third is uh, Taylor Rundell. Uh, Taylor's a national economist for the Australia Workers Union National Office. And I'll also mention Taylor's a Crawford graduate. So very happy to have you back here, Taylor. Uh, as well, and of course the AWU has been very involved on some of those advocacy issues uh, Richard was mentioning. Um, all right, so yeah, really interested to hear what you have to say, and um, I'll invite Steve to kick off the discussion. Thank you very much, and what's it afternoon? Nearly. Uh, thank you for the, to the ANU for inviting us to this uh, very important event. I must be honest, I made some cryptic notes about what I heard today, um, and I'd like to share some of our thoughts. But just to go back to why did we form this association and, and what are some of the major benefits, I think in the times we're going in now, in the times of rapid change, um, there's a couple of things that are important. One is to really collaborate with government and all the stakeholders regarding the program. Um, it's a very good program, but we need to improve a lot of things. Um, the second thing is, is, from a membership point of view, we share a lot of information, experience, and knowledge, and I think that is gold. Um, and we have, you know, and, and when we look at membership, everyone says, why are everybody, all the AEs not members? Well, we also want to have like-minded people to drive the program and to improve the program. I think the outcome is very, the intent of our members is very clear that we want to improve uh, on an ongoing basis and make it one of the best schemes in the world. But just to reflect on some of the issues that I picked up in the discussions here today. First of all, I think we've got very similar challenges, whether you're in the US, Philip, and I was really interested in your talk, and the Canadians as well, and even the RSA scheme. I think we've got very similar challenges. But you've highlighted some very key things. One is um, that uh, the high cost of labor that's increasing all the time and that we've got to be mindful of that. And I think the importance of forward planning. The days of flicking your finger and saying, I want 20 workers tomorrow, I, don't think, I think those days are over. So that's the first thing that I really picked up from the presentation. The seasonality of horticulture, I don't think a lot of people understand how important seasonality of horticulture is and how these swings happen. And when we start talking about 30 hours per week, over eight weeks, this becomes a very major consideration because um, we're dealing with a lot of flex, uh, issues that go on all the time. Now, if you just take Easter, we've lost how many days, three days, just like that, or four days in a working week. So you've got to make that up at some stage. So these are the swings, and we also have these shoulders on on peaks and troughs in horticulture. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to just reflect a bit on um, COVID. Now, COVID has done two things. One is it increased the cost of bringing workers in, but one thing it did do from a positive point of view, it brought, brought everybody together, where during COVID and through quarantine restrictions, which varied between states and territories, 
the collective effort of everybody managed to bring in a record number of seasonal workers, which, is, uh, which I think we've got to acknowledge and really support. I think these other th things that I just want to ma uh, mention is that the barriers for growth, I think we need to address many of the inefficiencies that we have and consistency of application of policy is a key issue. We also need to start reviewing what works well and what doesn't work and start fixing it. Those are things that are important to us as members. Um, <clears throat> we also want to speak, we mentioned mechanisation. Um, yes, that's a very interesting debate. And uh, the more labour costs go up, the more we're going to be forced for me into mechanisation. That's a, that's a reality. I think the other thing you mentioned was consolidation of producers, economies of scale. Very much noted, that's happening everywhere in the world. But we have consciously tried to protect the smaller growers because they're very important to our economy in, within Australia. Um, <clears throat> and then I think some of the um, things that I think we need to look at very closely, and all the other schemes have said it, we just don't do it in Australia, and that is industry-led with third-party accreditation systems, something we really need to consider and debate. And then lastly, I just want to say collaboration and forward planning is what we need and what we encourage as the AEA and our members, and I thank you all for being here today, our members, and for everybody else, and thank you for the opportunity to summarise our thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I'll now introduce Emma. Over to you, Emma. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm standing on, their leaders, past, present and emerging. As a Pacific Islander, it's very important for me to do that. I also acknowledge uh, all our Indigenous um, community members and leaders who are joining in. Um, the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland has a mandate to be a voice for all our Pacific community members and um, communities around the state. So as a voice, we do recognise that the workers that end up at, uh, in Queensland at any uh, location uh, are our members. I guess um, from uh, what uh, we've heard and uh, um, today uh, and uh, with the presentations that have been given online, um, there are a few things that uh, uh, we would like uh, to um, just make comments on. Uh, one in particular is really around the industry-led um, that New Zealand has uh, uh, talked about and we can see snippets of uh, that uh, happening in, in the US and, and uh, Canada. Uh, I think um, uh, with what's happening now, there's uh, probably uh, room and, and that, that will happen uh, down the track. There's also the collaboration that has taken place, um, thanks to COVID, that uh, we've all had to come together. Uh, before COVID, everyone was doing their own thing, and um, we have now um, uh, come to know who's doing what in what space. Um, in the uh, comments that we have uh, for the uh, uh, last presentation, one of the areas that uh, I'd like to bring up is the importance of the church. Um, we left out uh, the, the work that the church has been doing. Um, Pacific Islands Council of Queensland is part of a partnership uh, with the Salvation Army and the Uniting Church and uh, the Pacific Islands Council of South Australia. Um, we are so very grateful for the churches who have been um, advocating for our workers uh, even well before uh, we're, we, we're talking about seasonal workers. The churches have the infrastructure, the capability to support uh, migrant workers, and I think it's very important that uh, we bring them in, um, in the space of the community connections. We're so very grateful. Um, and I'll give you an example. We do deal with quite a number of our workers who are disengaged. Um, some are uh, not their fault, 
but we've been ending up with the support that's needed for them. Um, our organization isn't funded for those types of support. Um, so what we do normally do as diaspora is uh, look at services uh, that are around us, um, and thanks to the churches, uh, some of them have been able to help our workers. Uh, this, it's quite important that uh, they are continuously uh, part of uh, this conversation, and uh, I'm so very grateful for, for people like Mark, those of you who know, who's always uh, um, out there helping our workers. There's also the importance of, um, and I'll just address the <laughs> Um, elephant in the room. We're, we're seeing quite a lot of undocumented workers who have come through this, this program. Um, the reason why I'm raising this is uh, um, when something not so nice happen in, happens to the undocumented worker, the, the community has to fork out. Um, for example, if someone dies, um, and whether that person is um, um, you know, Fijian or Tongan, um, the, the Pacific Islander communities have to raise money to send that uh, person across to where they've come from. So it's an important area that uh, I believe needs to be addressed at some point now, because uh, as a taxpayer, if we don't address it now, we will be uh, needing to look at uh, initiatives that will, um, you know, help these undocumented workers. And I'm, you know, th thinking of what uh, the Canadians have done uh, in that respect. Um, apart from that, it's been such a, a blessing uh, just to have to work with uh, um, each of you. Um, I will always have to say, uh, on behalf of our Pacific Island countries and people, I need to thank all the employers that have brought our people here because it's um, uh, an investment that uh, only you uh, have had to um, uh, bear the burden. So thank you for bringing our people here. Vinaka. Vinaka, uh, Emma, bringing that perspective to our proceedings. And uh, finally, Taylor, welcome back to Crawford. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Stephen, for welcoming me back to Crawford. I didn't actually get to spend that much time here because of a uh, few events over the last couple of years, but it is, it is good to be back. Uh, so I'm the National Economist at the Australian Workers' Union, uh, so covering policy for the huge range of industries that our 70,000-odd members are in, one of those being horticulture, We've really uh, made an effort to be more active in this space, uh, given the huge range of issues that come up for workers of all of the different visa categories and for Australian workers in the sector as well. Uh, we've been a big supporter of the Pacific labour schemes broadly. Uh, you know, they obviously play a key role in development uh, of those countries and development of our relationships within the regions. Uh, they play a huge role in developing lasting connections between Australia and people from Pacific Island nations. And perhaps most importantly, more so than any other migration scheme that is available for uh, farmers, they incorporate protections for workers, including in particular uh, the requirement for employers to be approved uh, to make sure that they are operating uh, you know, safely, soundly, fit and proper people who are complying with all of their obligations before they can enter the scheme. Um, we've heard some very interesting comments today across all of the different schemes that uh, have been discussed. Uh, just one of the notes that I wanted to make on uh, Richard's presentation, which I think covered some really interesting points about the size of the program, uh, the Pacific programs, and the potential for them to grow quite significantly. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, we had 150,000 odd working holiday makers. Of course, not all of them were working on farms at any given time. Um, and by late last year, that number had fallen significantly, as we saw in Richard's presentation. 
Um, the Palm Scheme, of course, has not made up that gap, uh, despite the steady increase that's happened during the period of the pandemic. Um, but DFAT has also said in some of their publications that there are 50,000 pre-screened workers um, who are, you know, potentially able to come to Australia in the near future. Um, however, the Palm Scheme is also opening up to sectors beyond horticulture and agriculture, and that will create some competition for uh, where workers are uh, seeking to go and where they're able to um, use their skills while they're in Australia. The other piece of uh, Richard's presentation, it does come up in uh, the debate around the Pacific schemes, is uh, the governance of the scheme, compliance measures, and uh, what has broadly been called red tape. Uh, you know, I always come back to the fact that the Pacific scheme at its heart is a development program as much as it is a labour mobility scheme, which means that we need to uh, do our best to create the preconditions for economic benefits for migrant workers coming to Australia. And a key part of that is making sure that they have safe working conditions here in Australia, that they're not going to be exploited, that they're not going to be underpaid. Uh, this means that uh, compliance is not just a burden, that it has benefits for the workers that are there, uh, that are here in Australia. And we can see the clear difference in the way that the working holiday makers scheme is operated with very little oversight and very, very visible um, exploitation that has come up over time uh, versus the Pacific scheme where even if the protections that we have in place now are not perfect, we can see the impact that they're having and also the ability of DFAT, of consulates, of um, welfare and support officers and of employers to respond to uh, welfare concerns when they emerge. You know, no one wants red tape or bureaucratic processes for their own sake and any streamlining, any um, opportunities to digitise information collection and so on are sensible. But, uh, you know, any core conditions of the Pacific program shouldn't be compromised in an effort to bring workers to Australia more quickly. Uh, and we have seen some significant issues for workers in the Palm Scheme in recent years. Uh, one of those is around overcrowding and accommodation standards. So uh, early last year, the AW was involved in uh, bringing to the attention of authorities 70 workers under one roof who are all paying $130 a head in Tasmania. Uh, these were workers from Tonga uh, and they were housed near Davenport. And it was actually local government that took the first set of actions because of uh, property violations, planning violations. There's obviously a huge opportunity for local, state, federal government uh, and stakeholders, community groups and unions and employers to collaborate to make sure that this sort of extreme, uh, you know, failure to meet basic standards doesn't happen. Another piece that we've heard a little bit about today is around deductions. Uh, you know, obviously there are costs that are faced by workers and costs can come up in different ways. There are standard costs around transport and accommodation, and then there are circumstances where a worker might, for example, seek a cash advance from an employer um, and uh, not have a full understanding of the arrangement that they've entered into prior to, um, to agreeing to it. I note from the discussions before that we've had about the American and Canadian schemes that transport costs are incorporated. Uh, that is a notable difference to the Australian scheme, and I think that minimising some of the um, opportunities where deductions uh, become more complex or create concerns would be a potential avenue to increase transparency and reduce the complexity of, uh, of the Australian schemes. Uh, portability between employers, uh, whether they're approved or uh, temporary secondments to non-approved employers, uh, these are issues that uh, have been discussed vigorously uh, the Palm Advisory Committee and among the many people in the room here, and the complaints handling process and grievance management for uh, workers. You know, there's many avenues that those grievances can be raised, but it's not necessarily clear to workers which one is going to be the most effective to resolve a problem, whether it's dealing directly with an employer, dealing with um, welfare and support officers, dealing with their home country consulate and so on. Um, you know, recognising that for many workers this is 
uh, one of their first experiences engaging in a sort of formal employer-employee arrangement. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the concerns that we have is that the conditions um, that exist, if they're not applied uniformly across the broader horticulture sector, is really a potential for employers who are not doing the right thing to undermine the viability of the scheme as a whole. Uh, you know, we would like to see uniform standards to avoid all of these questions about working holiday makers being cheaper to hire, about the need for uh, agriculture visas with lower levels of protection. There have been uh, 10 reports by our count since 2016 that have described exploitation of workers in the uh, horticulture sector as systemic. This doesn't necessarily mean every employer is doing the wrong thing, but it means that it's enough of a problem that it's undermining the ability of uh, employers and of workers to you know, meet the needs that are being expected by law. We uh, you know, we would want to see uh, the growth of the PALM scheme, but we would also want to limit any uh, opportunity that would undermine the scheme in terms of creating new avenues for people to arrive in Australia without the protections that exist under the PALM uh, scheme. And of course, we'd like to see uh, the conditions that are set out vigorously uh, enforced, uh, which you know, it hasn't always been the case and has sometimes taken some time for issues to be brought to the attention of various authorities. And, of course, if uh, there isn't compliance measures or enforcement that, uh, that protect workers, ultimately the costs end up falling on community organisations, NGOs like Emma's. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to to uh, respond to the presentation by Richard and uh, for the presentations we've heard today. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks very much, Taylor. Thanks to all our respondents, uh, including for you know sticking to time. And in fact, we do have a bit of extra time. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, Richard, <laughs> we might, you know, because you've all been sitting here patiently, uh, actually have a few questions uh, in person or um, from our guests uh, online. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to invite questions and perhaps uh, while you're gathering your thoughts, I might just ask Philip if he'd like to make some reflections on what he's heard about um, Canada, but especially about Australia and New Zealand. So over to you, Philip. I'm not sure. Yep. I, can, I can stand. Well, in, in, in sort of thinking about it, we're looking for what would be the ideal scheme because what we want is, you want to have a competitive agricultural sector that treats people well. I mean, that's what the whole goal is. And when I think about what kind of the ideal scheme is, it's perhaps what comes closest is what we call the Canadian Combine Scheme. And what it does is, it brings Canadian-based combining companies who move south into the center of the United States, and they combine wheat, and they go from south to north with H-2A guest workers, many of whom come from South Africa. They use the most modern equipment. They pay very high wages. The wheat gets combined much cheaper because it doesn't take that long in any individual farm. Uh, and because they're using the most modern equipment, the cost per bushel or whatever is much lower. And it's a system that works and depends on the, temper the weather differences between two countries and all that kind of things. Okay, so that's highly mechanized. They can afford to fly people in from halfway around the world. A and the question is, how close could you take that model to what's really repetitive work, picking fruits and vegetables? And I don't know enough about Australia, but the systems that work best that I've seen are often labor hire companies that have contracts with big farmers who in turn have, big, have contracts with big food service companies, restaurant chains, or supermarkets. And they, they all protect their margins. So we just did a case study of a 
lettuce, leafy greens, so it's lettuce, broccoli. So 30,000 acres, so what is that, 12,000 hectares or something like that. And they build in margins. They say, we know, we're going to be in business 52 weeks a year. Some weeks, the price is going to be way up because of weather or something. Sometimes it's going to be, but you're going to, we're going to build in a margin that we can operate lawfully and pay people correctly. And so we're not like, I mean, what Richard said is correct. The United States has 2 million farms. And if you look at income taxes, 1.7 million lose money year after year after year after year. Okay, what are they? They're small operations. Many are retirement or hobby operations, but they count as farmers in our statistics. So all the averages you see in the census bag are, are all worthless because they're including all those small farms that don't really count. Ag is really not even an 80-20 sector. It's a 10-90 sector. The 10% biggest account for 90% of the output and 95% of the profit. We, just like you and everybody, you know, those small farmers are the founding links back to George Washington and everybody, and we can't, of course it never works, but we try to, we still try to preserve the small farm. But the, if I, if there's anything that I've seen that go, that, that would help, it's you need contracts that build in margins for people in the production system. Because if I'm a labor hire company and I, come up to you and I really want to work on your farm and I say this is what my cost is going to be and you say oh no but this guy can do it a little cheaper so that pushes everything down what I would what I was I was hired by the government to look at this and I said what we really need is just like we have at the airport for security some people are trusted travelers they go on a short line you don't have to do that because you have to give up information and your fingerprints and other people are normal and then if there's a certain class of category that looks suspicious or whatever, you give them extra screening. But we need an ABC rating system so that A-rated employers get basically trusted. You can increase the penalties if you want, but A-rated employers don't. I would certify them for five years. It's a C, it's gonna ha I would give the workers five-year visas so they don't have to show up at the consulate every year. I mean, after all, in the US system, you've got to bust the worker from the mountains down to the consulate. It's a three-day process. There's the private companies that do the biometrics and stuff. You have to be available for an interview with a U.S. consular officer, even though only about half of 1% are ever interviewed. And then you, because you never know, the consular officer is sick that day. The third day, you get your, your passport back, and then you get on a bus and, and go. If you could leave right from your home country, you could fly. It would just be, you would have a multi-year visa. You would get the job offer from the employer. You would have to, of course, call and verify, because these things will be faked about as soon as you do it, but you could cut down on the fact that workers tend to arrive tired because people are trying to cut costs all the way through. So I guess, I guess, I, I, you know, I understand we're a, a market system, we want to provide opportunity, but what I see far too much of is small farmers trying to get into the business and needing to cut corners and that sort of brings, and small labor hire companies trying. I mean, I've run across labor, con you know, you have to pay weekly in agriculture in most parts of the United States. People are taking out, you know, so I pick Stephen Strawberry. I do a bad job. He doesn't pay me. I've got to make a payroll. I have to take a loan out against my truck or I don't pay my workers. This happens all the time where you get all kinds of issues because there's a lot of on low capital, agriculture is a seasonal business, prices go up and down. People without, you, without much money will try to stay in business, and one way they'll stay in business is because they're hiring vulnerable workers and they know it, and they'll take advantage of the vulnerable workers. It happens all the time. So some mechanism by which you rate in advance the risks associated with particular employers and trust those that you trust and maybe have normal for first timers and maybe look out more carefully for people who've had problems. I mean, so, something like that, you'll never have enough enforcement people and there'll never be enough media or unions or NGOs, but some way of encouraging the best and having the market reinforce that, that's what third party certification systems try to do. Uh, some means of doing something along those lines, I think could help. I mean, there's always going to be Exposés. I mean, in agriculture, I mean, you, know, you get a you know, geographically dispersed industry. 
and you, you know, when media journals call up, they, they want to do farm labor. Well, what do you want? Because they usually written their story. You can, act, you can find cases where farmers really do treat workers like family, uh, not the old myth about you marry the family's daughter and stuff. There is a social division. That doesn't happen anymore. But you can also find things where you've seen it's almost back to slavery. I mean, so you can find a whole spectrum of experiences out there. And when something good comes up, of course, it doesn't get written about very much. But when something bad comes up, it gets written about a lot. And everybody is, is that the tip of the iceberg or not? And, and that's the hard question. We really don't know uh, because it's hard to find the negative. But I will say, Whenever you see, when there's no money and a whole lot of people not doing well, that's when people cut corners. And one of the easiest things to cut is on labor, especially if they're vulnerable workers. And so the only way to get around that, I think, is some way to privilege those that you know or expect to know who are going to abide by the system. And you can give them lower fees, faster, you know, just let them do their self-certification, self-processing, a whole lot of different things that you could wind up doing. It's not perfect, because you could wind up with a big operator who goes rogue. Uh, but presumably, those, there would be some self-policing among them as well. And uh, the, you know, the, a system where people, you, know, you can almost look transparently at the contracts. People can make money, uh, and, and it's, it's where you sort of wonder, how, how can they make it? It's usually you'll find out that they're cheating on something. I mean, I gave you the example already. I mean, there's so many farmers who don't pay, so many small farmers who don't pay required payroll taxes because they can tell the workers never, ever apply. And therefore, the workers aren't going to apply. And therefore, the farmer can get away without paying and save 10 or 15% on payroll. And that can be significant. So that's my big suggestion when you think about it, the ideal system is. It's fine to be industry-led and stuff, but have everybody buy into the notion that among all those who are going to participate, there's a subgroup that are going to be like the trust travelers. And you're going to trust them because they are going to be expected to uphold all the rules and regulations. Hopefully, they gain <laughs> economies of scale and get higher productivity so that they can offset the cost of compliance compared to the others and provide that insurance <laughs> to their clients that they are going to be above board. That's my sense of it. Great. All right, thanks for, the, for those reflections. Yeah, we do have a bit of time, and you could ask, uh, yeah, let's go, please go ahead, Kerry, right? Just introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone, Kerry McCarthy. Um, we're growers and approved employers. Um, thank you, Philip, for your insight and experience and advice and ideas. Um, a huge issue in Australia is illegal labour, cash labour. It's um, affecting the farm gate prices. Um, as we've said, we farmers are price takers. And to be ethical employers is actually costing us a lot in production costs. We um, collectively don't believe the Australian government is doing enough to stamp out illegal employment in Australia. Um, very interesting to hear the report on the RSE scheme and saying that um, the option to abscond is no longer an enticement because there is no other employment for them. So I would hand that over to Stephen and Richard to investigate why the RSE scheme has done so well in stamping out illegal labour in New Zealand because that's something that's very important to Australia. The Palm program will never reach its full potential until illegal labour is stamped out in Australia. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Kerry. We'll take that as a comment and we'll move over this side. I'll just give it. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Grace from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, my team's looking at modern slavery and human trafficking via sort of the lens of transnational serious and organised crime and we're focusing on agricultural visas. So I suppose I want to ask um, how often do complaints about those kinds of issues directly to employers or to DFAT staff or to unions or to country consulates, how often are those complaints referred to police and is there a good relationship with law enforcement and how often does that progress to prosecution? Um, I don't know who would be best right. placed to answer that. 
No, well, that's really, um, yeah, maybe a question for DFAT, but I think DFAT's not really in a position to perhaps, Fair enough. Uh, I, I don't know, Carly, do you want to say anything or perhaps um, I don't, only feel? Uh, yeah, I can say just very briefly that um, any time an allegation is brought to our attention, um, provided we have sufficient evidence to take it further, so for example, the name of the worker and the name of the employer, we can, under the deed and guidelines that we have with approved employers, issue a notice to report, which essentially is a requirement that the approved employer bring forward further information in relation to that allegation. I don't actually have the statistics on me, I'm sorry. I, I mean, we could, we could look at that, but certainly where there is evidence of a breach of, a, of the Fair Work Act, we would refer that immediately to the Fair Work Ombudsman for further investigation. Um, and where there is evidence of a crime, we would absolutely refer that to the appropriate authority as well. I, do, I don't know how often that's actually happened. Uh, we do have those statistics, I just don't have them handy, I'm sorry. Thanks, Carly. Uh, other questions or comments? Yep. Uh, Sue Finger, I'm an approved employer. Um, I was interested in Charlotte's um, presentation on skills training and particular, in particular her comment on the portability basically back to the Pacific rather than looking at what necessarily our needs are but what are the needs of the Pacific as far as economic development and I was just wondering whether anyone's got any um, thing to um, help me understand what is actually needed and maybe do we need to be talking to the Pacific about their needs and particularly the workers themselves needs rather than perhaps the bureaucracy in both countries. Okay well I might hand that over. And <laughs> Thank you. I'll hand it over. I think Charlotte's still with us. Uh, could you hear that question Charlotte and could you tell us more about the skills training in New Zealand and, and sort of how appropriate it is from the workers point of view? Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, we have got a question online uh, from Trevor Ramoni from the Solomon Islands High Commission. 
but it's for uh, Robert Falconer. I, I'm, I'm guessing that Robert's no longer online uh, because it's probably quite late in uh, Canada. But yeah, I think a lumber, we've heard about the Solomon Islanders who've actually gone to Canada and, and in fact have got PR. So we'll certainly follow up on that question for you, Trevor. Uh, but I don't think we'll be able to answer it now unless Robert does uh, put his hand up and could speak. Um, while we, we'll, go, we'll keep going then with the questions. Yeah, Mark. Or comments, yeah. Uh, Mark Sanzak from the Uniting Church. Actually, now that I know Charlotte's online, I'm keen to probably put a question. I was very puzzled by, Charlotte, you saying that New Zealand has largely eliminated the problem of uh, illegal work um, within the farm sector. That's Because in Australia, that's a massive issue. And, I mean, the ABARES ABA data, for example, doesn't include, you know, going in and uh, surveying employers, saying how many illegal, how many workers you're employing illegally. Um, unsurprisingly, they're not including those numbers in there and that was a very, you know, that is a significant part of uh, the competition um, and those illegal workers are far more attractive than um, working holiday makers uh, because effectively they are ruthlessly exploitable um, and they have no recourse to, to any ex exploitation because largely if they report it they'll get removed. So I'm interested as to how did New Zealand actually tackle this and um, how did they not have a problem with um, lots of people turning up and trying to misuse the protection system to effectively gain a work visa. Just one point of clarification, my question about people applying for protection, I was talking more in Australia, the issues about people not on the PALM scheme using the protection system. So, as I said, tens of thousands of people turning up from Malaysia or Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, those places and making meritless claims for, for protection and then running out the clock. So effectively you apply, you get rejected by the department, you go to the AAT, you get rejected there, but that can take you two, three years, and then you apply to the federal court. Um, so you run the system and you effectively get a work visa using the protection system, but you're outside of the palm scheme. These are not palm scheme workers who are applying that. And I'll, we see a lot of those, I mean the thousands of those workers, those people ending up on farms. But I just said they're not then working illegally properly. Right? Well, if they're on a protection, yeah, if they've got a protection, they're not working illegally, but you also see a lot, you see a lot on tourist visas who haven't used the protection system as well. Okay, any final chance for comments and questions? Yeah, right at the back. Wait, just to wait because we need the, the mic so that people online can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, my name is uh, Bobby Porakali. I'm an approved employer but also an academic that researches this space. I'm um, just going on from the point that we've seen a rise in absconding seasonal workers. What is the department doing to prevent this? I mean, sometimes there is merit in them absconding. 
they might be, be treated unfairly. But for other times, there might be no, it might not be founded. So as an approved employer, we'd just like to know what the department is doing to discourage this. Yeah, I think this might not be the forum to um, ask questions to the department, um, although you're welcome <laughs> to speak, Kelly. But um, yeah, I don't know, would um, anyone else, that's a, a big issue. Uh, it has become a big issue in the scheme. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go to one of our discussants. That'd be appropriate. Um, I mean, we have been as aware as anyone else about the issues of absconding. I think in a lot of cases, they are driven by uh, by experiencing poor conditions on farms, not necessarily universally. There are certainly situations where people uh, don't have a full understanding of what they've signed up to before they arrive in Australia. But, um, you know, there is a concern that if a worker comes here, they're treated poorly and they don't have um, the acumen or a pathway to resolve their problems, to transfer to another employer um, or to sort of leave the scheme formally, that they feel like they're left without any other options. Um, there is also a question that, I have in my mind about the language that's used in this space and uh, if people are described as absconding or sort of leaving the program, then um, doesn't that put them off re-engaging with the program, that they're going to sort of sit in their uh, undocumented status and uh, stay outside of the formal visa system, which is of course what everyone, you know, wants the, the migration system to do. We want people to uh, comply with the visa conditions that they sign up for when they arrive in Australia. Thanks, Taylor. In fact, uh, so perhaps we'll, we'll close this by just inviting the other two discussants as well, if they want to comment on this issue or make any other closing remarks. And then that's a good way to wrap up, because then I'll, I'll just close the session. Uh, Emma, would you like to add anything on this or any other topic? I guess for, for the community organisations, uh, there also needs to be a platform for the workers to have a voice. Mm. Um, at present, um, um, the voice of the workers uh, uh, is not heard if they're scared of their employers. Um, so that's one of the areas that uh, uh, we would welcome, even the Approved Employers Association, if you, you would help us set something up because um, the workers tend to tell us that uh, they're scared to speak. Mm. Great. Thank you. I meant to say that because it um, leaves uh, them up for exploitation. Right. So it's just a major issue that from both sides of the perspective, not only the food employed, but the yeah. welfare of the worker as well. So no, I, that's I fine. I didn't Thanks, Bobby. I necessarily clarify that. Good. And we are just running out of time. But is, it's a definitely big issue. Steve, I'll invite you to... First of all, uh, you know, a lot of assumptions are made. We need very good data and evidence to back up some of the things that are said about people are unhappy on a farm or um, the, the whole escalation process. We need to do a lot more in country to educate the workers before they leave. I don't think that's been done properly in, in some cases. So, again, let's get the data, let's get the facts and the evidence so we can make very sound, logical business decisions on what is working and what's not working and what are the actual reasons why people uh, leave their employment. Um, because at the end of the day, we as AEs are losing a lot of money and we're not protected. And uh, the work has all the protection but not the AE. So those are the things we need to work very hard on. So thanks very much. All right. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bobby, for raising that question. It would be a good one to discuss over lunch. Um, it, we are now uh, out of time, so I'll just make a few closing remarks and then we will, uh, we will break for lunch. We've actually just got a really good question here from Alan Gamlin, uh, which is about the, I guess, about the future, uh, especially on the demand side regarding temporary foreign workers. Uh, I think Alan will, um, you know, that actually goes to my closing remarks, so I, I think we won't be able to answer that right now, but I... Uh, it's a good question to pose uh, for us. Uh, so I just want to close, uh, of course, by thanking all our speakers uh, for great presentations. Uh, thank you all for coming. 
uh, and everyone who's joined us online. Uh, I want to thank uh, Richard for organizing this and uh, Ari, who you can see is working very hard, and Beth to uh, put this uh, workshop together and of course our um, audio and uh, video crew for, for making it all uh, happen and it went, it went pretty smoothly. These are not easy events to organize. Uh, I want to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Thank you for coming along, Carly, and for your opening remarks. But also thank you for uh, your funding that you provide for our labor mobility research. I mean, I always like to say that we started researching labor mobility before it was popular. I think our first uh, workshop was in, was in 2012, so it was about 10 years ago. Um, but certainly we've been able to uh, keep going and expand what we're doing uh, on the back of that DFAT funding, so it really is uh, invaluable. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do think this uh, workshop, you know, does uh, open up or, or mark, should mark the beginning of a new era of research for us. Um, we have done a lot of work. It's been great to have Charlotte as part of our team and um, with Richard and myself and a few other colleagues, we've done a lot of work comparing the New Zealand and Australia schemes and it's clear that that's still a very relevant um, comparator and very relevant theme and perhaps some of the messages uh, from that research still haven't really got out, like what is different about the New Zealand labour market. Uh, I do encourage you all to read our blog where we have a lot of material and Charlotte actually, you know, will keep you up to date on what's happening in New Zealand. Well, we'll try to keep you up to date on what's happening here in Australia. Um, so we would definitely want to keep going with that comparative research with New Zealand, but we have been thinking for quite a while that we really need to broaden our horizons and um, especially have a look at the US and Canada. I think the European Union, you know, countries have, have seasonal worker schemes as well, but they're rather different. They have that sort of added complexity of having that, the free movement of people uh, as part of the EU. I guess the UK is going to go back to a more traditional seasonal worker program with Brexit, but then that'll be very new. But I think these four that we've looked at today, they're a very natural set of programs uh, to compare. And, uh, you know, you would have, I, I, I'm sure I don't need to convince you of the utility of that and the number of angles uh, that, that are interesting to look at, you know, starting with the history. I think the, the US and the Canadian scheme have a lot longer um, legacy and, and, and more evolution, which I think is very interesting uh, to look at. Uh, the broader context uh, of the labour market in which they operate, but also the, uh, the goods market and the extent to which that's uh, oriented towards the export or the domestic uh, market and uh, to what extent it's dominated by large growers or small growers. Uh, I think specific design features, you know, we spend a lot of time discussing these things like multi-year visas, um, deductions, uh, what should be paid for by the employer, uh, what by the worker. Uh, portability uh, is a big issue. Uh, so I think, you know, broadening out to the look at all four and, and just to go through how they stack up on these design features, I think is a, is a really useful uh, exercise. And, you know, that then gives rise to comparison on specific policy issues. And, I mean, the issue of abscondings just come up. You know, that definitely seems to be an Australian rather than a New Zealand issue, but I think we're really yet to hear uh, whether that is an issue or not in the, in the US and, and Canada. Uh, the issue of, of worker exploitation or, or mistreatment. And then this whole question of getting the balance right, on the one hand, wanting to protect the workers uh, in this scheme, especially if they are tied to a single employer, that does introduce a degree of vulnerability. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, not weighting down the program uh, with so much regulation that uh, employers are discouraged from using it and then they stick with other sources of labour that are in fact are much less regulated. And so you have the sort of perverse effect that in fact you're, you're putting in regulations to reduce exploitation but you're going to end up increasing it uh, once you step back and look beyond the scheme. So yeah, that's the fourth issue, sort of specific policy issues. And the fifth issue is, is what is the future of all these programs? Uh, Charlotte talked about RSE sort of ne needing a, a makeover. And Alan's questions uh, you know, really go to that. We look at the sort of the longer term trends, uh, automation, anti-immigrant political trends. It's mostly time to wrap up. <laughs> and um, long term contraction, yeah, whether COVID is a sort of transitory shock or actually marks a permanent change. So I think that, that was my sort of fifth set of issues. Um, and yeah, I really hope that uh, now that we've um, you know, met Philip and we've got you know, we've had you here that we'll be able to continue collaboration with you um, and of course with Charlotte and Richard and my other colleagues and um, that was a great presentation from Robert so I think although Robert's gone we'll certainly want to follow up with him and I'd like to invite all of you 
if you're interested, you know, please stay in touch and, um, you know, watch out for this as a, a sort of new research project uh, that will be, or, or that you can consider launch today. All right, so with that um, optimistic note, uh, thank you very much, everyone, once again, and please do stay and join us for lunch. Thank you.